Welcome to today's lecture. And today we are going to be doing a little bit of almost like an art and craft. So what you need to do, and if you have the possibility to do it, be very careful if you're gonna do it, is get a tennis ball that is split in half. Not totally, like just still that it's still attached, but it's cut about halfway. And then a potato that is just ever so slightly smaller than the tennis ball. It's just like that. And then you'll also need a piece of tin foil that is as non-wrinkled as possible. So what we're going to be covering today is talking about how different, um, the different geomatic surfaces relate with each other. And because there are technically three surfaces that we use and you'll have seen those in the other videos. And then, um, then we're going to talk about how those surfaces project onto a, surf, uh, into a flat surface. So I'm going to apologize right now if I end up having to like pause the video and chase after my dog, who you can see his little ears sticking up here. He is quite excited that I have a tennis ball <laughs> right now. So the three geomatic surfaces that we have, we have the first one, which is our earth surface. Then we have the second one, which is the geoid. And we have the third one, which is our ellipsoid. Now, when we're dealing with these three surfaces, the very first surface we often think about is the ellipsoid, or actually a sphere, right? So we have a tennis ball that is, um, that is a, a sphere. Right, it's a perfect sphere. It's equal all the way around. the The radius is going to be the same no matter where you look on the actual ball, and this is how most globes are actually created. But what we're really looking for is the real shape of the Earth. There's actually a thirty kilometer difference at the poles than there is at the equator. As something spins, it tends to like, especially if it's round, it tends to flatten at the the poles and it gets wider in the center. So this is why we do a little bit of a slit in this. So we take our ball and we flatten it. So you can think of where the edges and the corners of the, the split, if you press down on those to have like a little gap here, you're going to end up with an ellipsoid, a little bit of flattening on the tops. This is really a better version of the Earth's surface. <laughs> And, um, and, and it's, a, it's a much better mathematical model of it because it is less than 30 kilometers in, in error. We're now down to meters of error that you're going to see. So when we're working with your surface, we actually calculate the ellipsoid for things such as satellites. Now this is a very easy mathematical model. And so it's easy to calculate surfaces based on uh, an ellipsoid. But the thing is, even though the fantastic um, images and photos that we get from our astronauts show and, and even like, upper satellites show that our Earth is like very nicely round. It actually has a different surface as well and that one is based off of the gravitational um, potential of the Earth and we call that one the geoid. So the geoid is the potato. So you can see that in the potato that we have dents in there, we have bumps, it's really lumpy, it's all kinds of crazy shapes. This is our mean sea level. So if you look at that, how would you mathematically model this so that you can calculate the shape of the Earth based on mean sea level so that a satellite can fly around based on it? Well, unfortunately, orbits don't really follow the shape of a potato. They are actually in the shape of an ellipse. So we can't rely on the shape of the potato to represent the, the shape of the Earth. But if you want an accurate measure of what is going on on the Earth's surface, you need the shape of the potato. That is why we have mean sea level. So mean sea level is all of this shape of potato. So how do these relate? Well, we have our tennis ball and we have our potato. What we want to do is put the potato and the tennis ball together so that we have a really good model. Now you can see that I've placed the potato inside. This doesn't work perfectly because of the fact that 
the potato itself has to be um, has to be smaller than the tennis ball but we don't really want that like on, in real life we want them to be about the same size because we want very little error so uh, if you have a potato that is like sticking way out and you can't really force it into the tennis ball it probably means that your geoid model is too big if your potato fits right in there and you can close up your, your, your tennis ball with no problem, then it is too small. So a good ideal surface is one that has a little bit of opening like this, just ever so slightly. So now I have a really nice geoid model that fits nicely into my ellipsoid model. So these two work together. They both show the shape of the earth they both show it based on two different things, and it is um, mathematically cal we can do a mathematical calculation at look like very specific locations. So this is a great model of Earth. So that is so if we go back to our board here, the geoid is my potato, and the ellipsoid is the tennis ball. So. My dog thinks he's going to get this tennis ball after, and he's not. So, <laughs> so then the last one we have is the Earth's surface. Well, if I have a piece of tin foil and I put it on, on and I close it all the way up and I fold up my entire surface, I'm going to have my Earth's surface. And so then it has the bumps. You're going to see bumps and wrinkles and all kinds of things that are happening in that. And so we... Um, when we're going to like stand on the earth, that's what we're standing on is the tin foil that's wrapped all the way around and making all the mountains and everything. I will show that at the very end of this lecture. So mathematically, we move between the tennis ball and the potato. We also have to take into account the thickness of the tin foil and how it's wrinkled to be able to get down to those. So for example, here in Calgary, we are just over a thousand meters or about a thousand meters, depending on where you are in Calgary, above mean sea level, which if you take that value and you compare it to Vancouver, which is only a few meters, 10 to 15 meters above sea level, we are now at very different elevations and very different thicknesses and wrinkles of the tennis or of the, the tin foil. So that kind of summarizes the three surfaces. So if I were to do all three of them all at once on the tennis ball, then that gives me my um, it gives me my shape of the earth. Now, and just because I'm trying to be cheap and I only use one piece of tin foil, I'll do that at the very end to show. But the next step that we have to worry about is how do we actually represent this? So this is where the mapping side of things comes in. So in mapping, we, all, we tend to take the round surface of the Earth and we put it into two dimensions. And so three dimensions to two dimensions. So if you want to pause the video in a moment, I want you to think and take your tin foil and your tennis ball potato combo. And I want you to create and, and cover the entire tennis ball potato without any wrinkles. So you can pause this now and give that a try. And welcome back. So once you've tried that, what did you come up with? Well, we know that if we were to try to cover the entire tennis ball potato with the tin foil, it's going to wrinkle because I just finished talking about that. So how can we do this without any wrinkles? Because it's really hard to wrinkle paper with no distortion, right? So what we have is we have our tin foil and our potato. There are three main ways to cover it. The first one, the most people that I've seen in the past, take the tin foil and wrap it like a cylinder. So this is a geometric shape, right? So this is what we call a geometric projection. A cylinder covers the whole thing and maybe you can look in the sides and you'll see it, but it, those, those, those sides don't really matter because now I can somehow project them onto this paper. The other way that you may have tried is doing a cone 
and putting it inside the cone. This is known as a conic, and it works in both directions, and any direction. The last one that we have is a flat plane. Now, if I do this, with the, it's kind of run around, but if I do this to you right now, looking at my tennis ball and potato, it's totally covered. You don't see it. So if I look top down, I cannot see it, so therefore it's totally covered. This is my azimuthal or planar uh, projection. We tend to use that one more for arctic and poles, but it, it is possible to have it at other angles. Now I just finished talking about angles. So what do I mean by different angles? So the, the first projection type is geometric. So we have conic, cylindrical, and azimuthal. So those are the three major geometric ones. Now I just finished talking about orientation. There are also three orientation projections that we can use. So the three orientation, and I'm going to use cylindrical because it's all they, as my example. But you can do it with conic and you can do it with azimuthal. So the first one is what we call our, um, our polar orientation, which is where it is straight up and down like this. So that everything's wrapped around, everything along the, um, the equator is, it is touching the paper. And therefore, there is no distortion at the equator, but a lot of distortion at the poles. So this is the, the polar. If I had conic, it's like a party hat. So it would just be like, you know, the, con the pointy part of the conic is at the North Pole or the South Pole. If we, um, if we use a planar, so I, think, I guess I'll just try to keep doing this. So we have, Oh, I have two dogs, so <laughs> this is a polar orientation. This is also a polar orientation for a conic. Now, if we do azimuthal, this is an azimuthal. This is azimuthal. They're both azimuthal projections. So, so with the um, with the, the geometric projection and the orientation, they can go together. The uh, next one for an orientation is equatorial, which is like this. So this is sideways. So this is also known as a transverse orientation. So if we have transverse, it's sideways, which means that running along the longitude lines, or one longitude line, it has zero distortion. So we do the party hat again. This time around, it is sideways. So the conic is sideways. And so that means that the pointy part is somewhere, is along the equator. If we have azimuthal, if we're doing a transverse orientation, it is sideways like this. So it's along, it's pointing up and down rather than pointing sideways and horizontal. So you can think of the transverse as everything kind of oriented to the side. The last one is known as oblique. An oblique, it means any angle at all. So if we take any angle, we're gonna go at like this angle, or this one, or this one. Any angle that's not straight up and down, which is our polar, or straight across, which is our transverse, is considered an oblique. So if we have the, the conic, and we wanted to do the conic, a little party hat. It's like the little drunken party hat off to the side. And it's the same with the other side, or upside down. <laughs> right? So any angle that goes along there. Same with the um, same with our azimuthal projection, where you can have a sideways projection going to the flat plane. So to summarize those three. We have our, our polar projection, transverse, and we have oblique. 
The next one that we have is known as, I, I call it kind of like the surface touch or um, the surface intersection, surface, whatever you want to call it. There's two of them. And so the, these are not like formal, like official names of categories. So they, they, there's no such thing. They just kind of like talk about them, but I'm just breaking them down. So there are two of them. The first one is known as tangential. So for us with uh, the tennis ball, if you take out the potato, tangential is just touching the side. So that is every single one that I've shown you so far because I can't really cut through the tennis ball very well. So tangential touches the surface at a single point or touches the surface all the way along a single circle. If we have a secant projection, the secant actually cuts through the Earth's surface, so like the Pac-Man. Now I can't show that with a conic because as you can imagine, I would have to remove a part of my tennis ball and put it on the other side. I can't do that. So and physically it just doesn't work unless I have like a big puzzle. So if you can imagine that what your, your, your conic is doing is it cuts through the tennis ball and, and it creates a conic, or not conic, a cylindrical projection as it's cut through and it has the tennis ball kind of hanging off to the side here. So the, the conic projection um, is the same idea as well as the cylindrical when it comes to working with the secant projection. So we have those two, so we'll call this surface. I think in the vid other videos I call it something else too. So I just kind of like every year it's something different. Obviously I don't ask you, what is the name of the category? <laughs> so this one is secant or um Tangent, sorry, tangent. So those, um, those are the two that how it slices through the edges. Now the next one that we have is known as our light. So this is how we actually project it onto the paper. So if you can imagine, there are three different places that we can put a light. So if we had a clear surface all the way around, and you, if you can imagine that, it's a clear surface, and I want to project all the shapes of the earth onto this paper, this flat piece of paper. So what I do is I put a light bulb on the inside, I can, as, uh, in, on the inside of my, my earth's surface. And if I put it directly into the center of the earth's surface, and so you can imagine it's sitting right in the middle of your tennis ball and it's projecting out onto your paper from that light bulb. So that one is known as mnemonic. I think I spelled it wrong there. I have to think about it. Mnemonic. Anyway, so <laughs> double check the other one. Don't don't go by this. I, when I actually write it out and type it out, I have all the, the spelling right down. But my engineering background doesn't allow me to remember how to spell things. <laughs> so, um, so mnemonic background. This is that center location. So what happens with that, if you can imagine the angles coming from the center of the tennis ball are much greater on the sides as the light goes from the center of the light bulb out to the paper versus what it is here. So we have a lot more scale distortion that happens on the sides of the projection. But mathematically, if you're doing something very close and along the center, then it is a perfect type of projection. And mathematically, it's very easy to calculate. The next one is what if we put the light bulb at the very end of the tennis ball? So it's right down here. So this would be at the very, like for example, where we are right now in Calgary, and you were to go down and you put the light bulb at the South Pole. So you put the light bulb at the South Pole, it's going to project the light out and it's going to go through Calgary. 
Well, what you see now is to go from, to project the, the light for where Calgary is, it's actually much less of an angle to go onto that paper. So now we've reduced the distortion, but we've lengthened the path length, right, of that, of that light. So now we have a few more distortions that we've got to deal with otherwise, so we now we kind of add in some distortions. So you have the center, which is mathematically easy, a little bit less, um, uh, well, it's easier to mathematically to calculate, but it does have a lot more scale distortion on the edges. We can move it out a little bit further, we have a little bit more or a little bit less of the, um, the, the distortion, but we have other distortions that are happening now because it has a much longer length that it has to go through and mathematically a little bit more challenging to calculate. So you have much smaller angles that you're working with. The last type that we can put light is let's say that the light is coming from the floor all the way up to the light, to, to, to the, the tennis ball or the, the earth's surface. And then as it goes from the the floor to the uh, to the tennis ball and then project straight up. Well, distortion wise, this really removes a lot of like scale angular distortion, right? So now we've removed angles from our calculation, but now we are dealing with with more complexity because now we're dealing with two dimensions going three dimensions, two dimensions at it at infinity. So our math now deals with infinity rather than dealing with like structured angles. So again, that becomes a very um, a, a difficult mathematical calculation. So to write those down, so we have mnemonic, we have stereographic. And we have the Uh oh, I totally forgot. Orthometric. <laughs> there we go. Orthometric. Just left my mind. So, when we're dealing with our Earth's surface, we have a geoid. We have a, um, like the, the, the ellipsoid. They fit together. We're tr always trying to figure out the mathematical model of that potato so that we can show it in the, like, and mathematically project it out so we can actually show exactly where we are based on where the mean sea level is. So people spend their lives doing that with the potatoes. <laughs> they're trying to calculate potatoes all, like they, their entire life, um, because it changes too. So it's always very fascinating. That's what geodesy is all about. Um, so we have the potato, we have the tennis ball. Those two are the main surfaces. We have our Earth's surface, which now if I were to try to fold it up all the way around my potato and tennis ball, I now have a surface that looks like this. And that is really truly what you're standing on. So we have to be able to calculate from the surface of this to the tennis ball, to the potato, and then we have to take all of that and project that onto a flat piece of paper and be able to represent those three surfaces. So this is the challenge in mapping. This is one of the things that makes mapping so fascinating because the Earth's surface is changing all the time. We also have the geoid that is changing all the time. We have new models and new mathematical calculations that come out of that, which changes the ellipsoid. And sometimes we use locational models of the ellipsoid and the geoid, sometimes we, and very local models of it. That's what I mean by locational. Um, and sometimes we use global, sometimes we use national. So there are so many different models out there that trying to find the accurate model that you need for your map is, is your biggest challenge. And then how do you project that onto a two-dimensional plane so that people can read it and use it in, for example, a screen or use it in a, like a construction project or use it in an oil and gas project, or use it in any, like a forestry. There's tons and tons and tons of different applications that need to know where we are located on the earth for, for both our shape, our size, our location, and our elevation. So that kind of sums up everything that we have learned in this lecture, and I look forward to, um, 
I guess, hearing comments. But now you will never look at a potato the same again. I have messed that up for you because now you're going to be looking at, hey, this is my geoid. Oh, this one is too long because it, it doesn't, it's too big and it will fit my geoid or my lipsoids. So anyway, so that is the end of today's lecture and I look forward to seeing you guys in class.